Hi, I'm Laura Flanders. This week on the show, the incomplete, true, authentic, and wonderful history of May Day. Author, historian Peter Limebar joins me to discuss the history of this red and green holiday. And later in the program, Avi Lewis, filmmaker, documentary maker, discusses worker-owned factories in Argentina. All that and a few words for me on Lucy Gonzalez Parsons, an intersectional thinker way ahead of her time, and more. Welcome to The Laura Flanders Show, where the people who say it can't be done take a back seat to the people who are doing it. People have heard of the holiday of May Day. They've probably usually heard either of an ancient pagan spring festival or a modern celebration of worker resistance. Well, our next guest has a new book that brings all of those holidays together. Peter Leinbaugh is Professor Emeritus at the University of Toledo and the author of many books, including the Magna Carta Manifesto, Stop Thief, The Commons Enclosures and Resistance, as well as his newest, The Incomplete, True, Authentic, and Wonderful History of May Day, just out from PM Press. It is my enormous pleasure to welcome you back to the show, Peter. It's good to be here, Laura. So incomplete, true, authentic, and wonderful. Sounds like a good thing. It is. It is. Uh, hooray, hooray, the 1st of May. Outdoor effing begins today. <laughs> All right. Well, tell us <laughs> yeah. a, a few of the roots. Uh, you're, you're taking us right into the heart of things, the spirit of it, which is clearly what animates you in the book. But for a lot of people out there, there's a, like a pagan festival, spring festival, there's the worker day holiday, and then there's even a distress signal. Um, yes. How do all these relate, and which comes first? Well, May Day is the international emergency distress signal, and it's French. It just means, come to my aid. Okay. Please help me. So check that off the list. Well, no, I think we need help now. I think all of us, but we can only help one another collectively. This is, and we are in an emergency situation, at least coming from Michigan, where they're even poisoning the water. Yeah. Okay. So... We need help, but the help must come from one another. And as you say, May Day is a day without work. It's a day without the job. It's a day without money. It's a day of fellowship. It's a day of nature loving. At a time when nature is collapsing. Nature as May Day itself, I think, Laura, is Neolithic mm -hmm. because it has to do with the fertility of the ground. So that was the first the first May Day holiday was the Spring Festival. Yes, exactly. And who would celebrate now? Who celebrates May Day well, now? who celebrated then, and how did they do it? Well, they celebrated in many different ways, from Scandinavia with barking dogs or making rough music with pots and pans or dancing around the maypole or going out in the woods and leaping over hedges and fences, and many maids went into the woods and came back different than they went out, <laughs> uh, to quote the Puritan who was opposed to May Day back in Queen Elizabeth's time. So the yeah. first was the Spring Festival, yeah. and then the Workers' Holiday. Before we get there, let's talk a little bit about, more about resistance and, and the U.S. experience. The Puritans went as hard as they could against May Day to try to wipe it out, right? They did. Who were they? they what was did. Tell us about that. I think the story here is the green side. There's a red side and a green side to May Day. And the green side begins with Thomas Morton in 1627, erected a maypole 80 feet high in Quincy, Massachusetts, called Marymount. And there, Indians, a Ganymede, being gay, gay people, runaway servants, even runaway slaves, danced and drank and had festivities on the 1st of May, 1627. And you know because? Well, you can read about it. We know about it because so much of history is written by the rulers. They went and attacked from Boston, Cotton Mather, William Bradford, they made class war against this rainbow coalition of multiculturalism that begins American history, really. It begins American lyric poetry, you write in the book. Yes, I do. And, and they, they said, here's a song. Now only read the last two lines. 
with a proclamation of the first of May, at Marymount we shall keep a holy day. Mm. So their notion of divine and of di and of the sacred meant love among one another. And, and we should say the Mary is M E R R Y, as in happy, not Mary as in Mary and Joseph. Right, right. This is a secular magnificat, we could say. Now the Puritans didn't like that. No, and they didn't like it at all. The Puritans are for the control of sexuality, therefore the expropriation of the uterus. They want to, therefore, the destruction of Indians. Therefore, above all, the imposition of endless work you mentioned for Cotton. our sins. Cotton Mather was one of the early, not just Puritan leaders, but also kind of traders and, um, yeah, commodifiers. Exactly. He wanted to turn the earth into commodities in order to trade. So we're talking about an economic conflict as well. Yes, uh, we are. There are different paths. Thomas Morton had a notion of abundance. Mather and the Puritans had a notion of scarcity, that you had to labor in the sweat of your brow for your bread, when all around you is the green world where fish and birds are there for the taking. I mean, I exaggerate somewhat. But in Virginia, the, working, the work week was four hours long among indigenous peoples. And this takes us to the second great story of May Day, the Haymarket story of 1886, the 1st of May, and that's the eight-hour movement. That's right. Eight hours a day. Yeah, because right at the end of slavery times, the note that with the 13th Amendment and the abolition of labor from sunup to sundown, comes the factory, comes the mines, comes the Gilded Age, where all that gold is for the 1%, but people from China, people from, from the Balkans, people from the Mediterranean, immigrants come, the Welsh, more Irish, and they come and they learn from the African American experience that with struggle, slavery can be abolished, mm -hmm. but they introduce racism as well. Part of the story of Lucy Parsons. Anyway, I, what I was going to say, is that the people who developed the mechanical reaper, bringing industrialization and mechanization to the Great Plains, to the Neolithic Age, the people who actually made those machines were iron molders, and McCormick, the McCormick reaper, his rate of profit was 71%. He cut wages by 15%. The iron molders went on strike. Four were killed by the police because McCormick and the Business Bureau of Chicago hired the police, the Pinkertons. This is the origin of police for the property developers, for the owners of the tools of production. The McCormick Reaper mechanizes Mother Earth. Now that abundance that we had with Morton, now that fertility of thousands of years becomes subject to the iron shaving of the reaper, and agribusiness prevails, ruining, by the way, the peasant life mm -hmm. because of lower prices in Europe and the rest of the world. It's a major globalizing of the human stomach. So the four are killed. Four are killed. Anarchists, socialists, communists, ordinary people, outraged and say we're going to have a meeting on the 4th of May at Haymarket, which is where the, where the hay came in, which is basically a gas station when you think about it, because it's horses that make things run, not cars, not the internal combustion engine. So at Haymarket there's a vast crowd, it's in the evening, and a stick of dynamite is thrown after the police come to disperse the meeting. And to this day, no one's sure who threw that stick of dynamite. Right. Certainly among anarchists, among some, there was a cult of dynamite. Certainly among the police, there was often provocations and agents provocateurs. So it remains a mystery. But what happened was it 
tremendous repression afterwards. Forget the law, lock them up, throw away the key, was what the sheriff said. And several ended up being hanged. Eight were accused. Eight were accused. One committed suicide, Louis Ling. Four were hanged, including August Spies. And his last words I would like to quote, if I can remember. The time will come when our silence will be more powerful than the voices you throttle today. That's August Spies. One of the labor organizers who summoned the crowd to the rally and was accused and, and executed. He was a part Chippewa Indian. So bring it up to the present day. Where are we? Where is May Day? And where should it be if we were to um, be true to the Albert Spies, Thomas Morton legacy? Well, first of all, it's a day without work. Second of all, it's a struggle against those who force us to work. Apartheid came down with a massive mobilization of May Day workers in South Africa. 2006, Si Se Puede in Los Angeles, Chicago, the largest May Day gathering in North America ever among undocumented Spanish-speaking Americans. That's our, that we need to remember. Living legacy. There's a great power in this day, in this May Day. We must remember the Haymarket Martyrs. Who, who, who preserved their name in history? In America, they, they moved Labor Day to September. And on May Day, they called it Law Day. This is the ruling class. But the people who remembered the martyr, remembered August Spies, Albert Parsons, Engel, and Fisher, were Mexicans. They called it the Day of the Martyrs. This is an international day, mm. and it began here in America. Is it still today a blue, a red-green day, a day of bringing those two together and remembering some of the green roots of the red uh, workers' re re workers' resistance movement? It has to be, Laura, because of all the talk about the Anthropocene, all the talk about climate change, all the talk about desertification, treating the Pacific Ocean as if it were a sewer. Uh, that is, the whole green side of the earth is being destroyed by capitalist imperatives of ceaseless production and accumulation and forcing work on everyone. So if the struggle ought to continue, and I'm with you on that, and the story needs to continue to be told that there are other ways to live, the way that Thomas Morton described and practiced, and not him alone, then what do we do? What, what would you have us do in the media and, and in this country, this May Day? Yeah, this May Day, first of all, Black Lives Matter is against this police state and against the prisons. We must open the doors of the prisons, number one. That's jubilee. Number two, Occupy. Occupy taught us to common, taught us to, of mutuality, taught us about how to be responsible for our own security, taught us how to be responsible for gathering our own clean water. This is an experience. These are two experiences, mm -hmm. I think, that we have, and many of our many of people who are listening, I hope, will remember and have stories from those two from those times. Of Black Lives Matter against the, the police state, basically, the racists, racism, and occupy. And then we gather to to common and to start the discussion about what kind of world can we build. And we do that with dancing? Yeah. <laughs> yeah <good. laughs> I want to have the dancing in there. Um, right. And finally, you know, because this is such a critical issue, we talk about it so often on the program, when you say open the doors of the present, yes. in the period that you're talking about, in the periods that interest you, how did people deal with um, conflict amongst them um, without locking people up and throwing away the key? Well, the biggest conflicts were those who were taking away the land from people. And there was, but because they had the state and the army behind them, it was difficult to go up against them. And it's very hard to lock up the 1%. And I'm not sure we want to lock up the 1%. Let's give them a chance to make amends. 
honest and true amends and reparations can help them. Because mm. we want the earth restored. We want to recuperate what's been taken from us. And when we fight those bosses, we will find that the divisions that have been, posed, have been imposed upon us, whether it's by gender, sexuality, racism, or age, will disappear. So does the feminist or the women's movement slogan, the personal is political, mean anything to you? The personal is political. Well, back in my day, it was Freud versus Marx. You know, so it was all books in the library. But when it came to actual creatures, fellow creatures, yeah, it's meant, it increasing, its meaning only grows. Now, the, no, the notion of the person is changing, thinking of transitional people. I'm amazed at what human beings can become, what we can be. It's not just personal, though. It's also social. It's also political. And the changes can happen very quickly, very quickly thinking of James Connolly and the Easter Rebellion. Very quickly, audacity, audacity, audacity. That's the rule of social change. The book is The Incomplete, True, Authentic, and Wonderful History of May Day. It's just out from PM Press. Peter Leinbar is the author. Peter, thank you so much for coming in. You're very welcome, Laura. That was Peter Leinbar author, historian. His new book is just out from PM Press. You can find a link at our website. Next, Avi Lewis, the filmmaker behind the movie The Take, was here recently, and I got a chance to get from him an update on the story The Take describes, the story of worker-owned and occupied factories in Argentina. Take a look. So, Avi, Lewis, we have a chance to talk with you about your extraordinary film, This Changes Everything. But while you're here, uh, I wanted to ask you about your other film, The Take, that we also featured on this Which program. Which came out 11 years ago. Has it been that long? It's been 11 years since it came out, and uh, yeah, and 14 years since we started working on it in Argentina. So that was a film about factory workers in Argentina who, in the financial crisis in that country, mm -hmm. instead of agreeing to be laid off, took over their factories and their means of production. Everybody wants to know how they're doing, what's going on, it's, and it's what an have they learned. I mean, you know, for people in communities um, to fashion local responses to global economic forces, I mean, this is just something that's captured the world's attention for, for very good reason. This is exactly what we need to, to unlock. And, you know, the, the folks in the movement in Argentina are doing amazingly well. There were, there were more worker takeovers of companies in Argentina in the last year than there were in 2002 when this phenomenon started. Except we don't hear about it. We don't hear a word about it, but, it, but it, it's a very robust movement. There are networks of these cooperatives. They now have some government funding. They're, the laws have been changed to make it easier. Struggles like the Zanon struggle, those uh, ceramic tile makers, the largest ceramic tile factory in Latin America, five, 600 workers, democratically operated under worker control. That last year, they won the definitive expropriation and the cancellation of all of the previous owners' debts. So this movement is alive and well in Argentina, but more importantly, it's been spreading globally. And it's been um, so exciting as someone who helped. I was one small part of bringing this story to the world. Um, but we know that the film is, has aired, has screened in factories that have yeah. been occupied by workers, from Chicago, the famous Republic Windows and Doors struggle, which is now the new era co-op, um, to V.O. May which was a former uh, pharmaceutical factory, in uh, industrial chemical factory in, in northern Greece, outside of Thess in Thessaloniki, where they, they took, the workers have taken over that factory and have been running it as a democratic co-op and shifting its production to green cleaning mm. products and other more sustainable materials mm. from a rather uh, dangerous uh, industrial process to much more sensitive ones in the community with the support mm. of the community for years now. Um, the film continues to be used by workers' movements as a source of inspiration. And is it your sense that there is growing an ecology or a market, for lack of a better word, of these cooperative industries, cooperative oh, oh, businesses, oh, they no can question. support each other? Yeah, I mean, th this is the really exciting thing in the last few years in the United States. So the working world was this, uh, and you, you've covered it on, on previous shows. We had you that. on the show back right. then, 11 years ago. You, the folks from Chicago. Yep. And, and people and, from the working and world. And people from the working world, which is a, 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 a democratically administered capital fund that supports worker co-ops. We had a chapter in Argentina, 
it's now self-sustaining and is independent from, from other operations around the world, uh, 10 years old. There's one in Nicaragua. And a few years ago, Brendan Martin, my co-founder in the working world, started a chapter in the United States. And things have really taken off. The fund has millions of dollars in it. There's a 98% return rate, all supporting democratic worker-run businesses. And we're now seeing, and this is where it intersects with climate justice, which is really exciting, fence line communities from Richmond, California, where the Chevron refinery has been poisoning people for, for decades, uh, to Jackson, Mississippi, and you've covered uh, some of the exciting developments there, um, are starting to turn to local community cooperative development mm -hmm. as a response to environmental and, and, and climate and economic concerns. But it's hard to survive alone in a capitalist economy if you don't have trading partners Regionally? And as we speak, and this could be an idea for, for a future segment, there is an emerging network of, of, of communities from Richmond to Jackson to right here in New York City and, and in the Rockaways where these communities are coming together, learning how to administer, because businesses need loans, yeah. businesses need to borrow money, sure. but when you have worker controlled or minority owned or local community businesses, the banks don't necessarily recognize you as a good bet. So there's this pool of capital that's growing and a network of people who are f coming together to teach each other how to loan and repay money and how to run businesses. And uh, it's just emerging now. And it's, it's, it's largely emerging in the context of the divestment movement yeah. and this divest invest framing where people are saying, if we're gonna get big institutions, municipalities, universities to divest from fossil fuels, they also need to invest in the sustainable post-carbon economy. And so these things are fusing, the worker cooperativism and the response, the local solutions to the climate and, and race and economic crises in this country are coming together. And, you know, there, maybe there's a third film in it for me. I don't know. Yeah, but, I hope so. But there's some exciting stuff going on. Well, if there is a third film, we want you to come back and tell us about First. it. First. You can find all our coverage of the working world and the uh, New Era Windows Company Cooperative in Chicago at our website. Thank you so much, Avi. Pleasure. Yes. That was filmmaker Avi Lewis. Workers shouldn't strike and go out and starve, but strike and remain in and take possession, said Lucy Parsons, lifelong partner of Albert Parsons, one of the American labor leaders most associated with the founding of the American May Day tradition. Lucy Parsons was of Mexican-American, African-American, and Native American descent. She was born into slavery, and she was an intersectional thinker and activist a century before the term was coined. Her work after emancipation led her directly into conflict with the Ku Klux Klan and into a lifelong partnership with radical typographer and organizer Albert Parsons. Lucy never ceased advocating for racial, gender, and labor justice all at once, and she's part of the movement that won us the eight-hour day. Parsons' husband, Albert, was one of the orators in Chicago who attracted thousands to a rally near Haymarket Square in 1886 on behalf of worker rights. After police charged the crowd and a stick of dynamite was thrown, he was one of those arrested and later hanged. Lucy it was who led the campaign to exonerate the Haymarket martyrs, and then she carried on their work, leading poor women into rich neighborhoods to confront the rich on their doorsteps, challenging politicians at public meetings, and marching on picket lines. She was the only woman of color and one of only two women delegates, the other being Mother Jones, among the 200 men at the founding convention of the IWW, the militant industrial workers of the world. There she was the only woman to give a speech. She called women the slaves of slaves and urged the IWW to fight for equality and assess underpaid women at a lower rate for union fees. She also called for the use of nonviolence and occupation of the means of production. You can see her principles in the sit-down strikes of the 1930s in Detroit, the civil rights movement of the 50s and 60s, and the Occupy movement of today. She died in 42 in a house fire at the age of 89, but in the celebration of May Day, her work endures. Long may her intersectional spirit live. Do you know of intersectional work that you'd like us to know about? Write to me, laura at lauraflanders.com, and thanks. Mm -hmm.